It was a day like any other. A day history was never meant to remember. The 7th of July, 2005. Susan Levy was a 53-year-old legal secretary from Hertfordshire. She was making her way to work by train, just like any other day. We don't know if she saw the man who killed her. We don't know if he looked at her or gave her even the slightest thought. What we do know is that at just after 8.51am on Piccadilly Line number 311, underneath Russell Square, Jermaine Lindsay would detonate a homemade explosive device hidden in his backpack. This explosion would kill 26 ordinary men and women. Susan Levy would be the first identified victim of the attacks. The story that day began five years earlier in Huddersfield, West Yorkshire. Jermaine Lindsay was only 15, but his path of radicalization had already begun. Spurred on by his mother, he had been caught at school spreading leaflets proclaiming obedience to, and at the time, little-known organization called Al-Qaeda. Had this been reported a year later, he would have been detected by counter-terror officers. Had it been a decade later, he would have been taken into custody. Instead, nothing was done to prevent what was coming except for a small school report naming Lindsay as a troublemaker. Now, we don't know how Lindsay met Muhammad Sadiq Khan, Shehzad Tanweer, or Hassib Hussein. All we know is that just before 7am on the 7th of July, the four were pictured on CCTV for the first time in Luton train station's car park. Khan, Tanweer, and Hussein had all arrived in the same car with Lindsay in a second. On arrival, the four had been observed to share a brief hug before taking rucksacks from Khan's car and making their way into the station. They had a train to catch. Earlier that day, the trio had set off from a property which they'd rented in Alexandra Grove, Leeds. The flat would later be described as a full-scale bomb-making factory by the intelligence services. The group were next seen at 7.22 a.m. They had all purchased return tickets to London, later boarding the 7.33 a.m. to King's Cross. Eyewitnesses would go on to describe them as happy, smiling, laughing, and looking excited. Some would even compare them to sports fans going to a big game. The final chance to stop them came at 8.26 a.m. CCTV caught them passing the security checkpoint at King's Cross Station. This was the final time that they'd pass any police officers that day. Eyewitnesses would later come forward to say that the four were seen hugging before making their way through the ticket machines, then separating and making their way to their targets. Still, little blame can be placed on the security being so relaxed. There had not been an attack on the London Underground since 1993 and there was no sign of any new threats. At least no sign that the security had been made aware of. In truth, both Tanweer and Khan were people of interest to MI5. Both had been connected to suspected terror training camps in Pakistan, and Khan had even been connected to a fertilizer bomb plot which had been thwarted the year before. He had apparently approached all one of the unnamed defendants in that case and informed them that he could get hold of a large amount of explosives. Despite this, MI5 had simply concluded that Khan was nothing but a fraudster, with little actual experience or access to explosives, or at least they hoped. At 8.50am on the 7th of July 2005, they would be proven wrong in the worst possible way. The explosions all occurred within 50 seconds of one another. First, the attack at Olgate Station, where seven innocent people would be murdered by Shazad Tanweer. Then came the attack at Edgware Road. Here, Khan would murder six people. And finally came the attack under Russell Square, where Susan Levy and 25 other innocent lives would be snuffed out in an instant. The final train had been particularly packed due to carrying additional passengers from an earlier cancelled service. Still, there were four bombers. So where was Hasib Hussein? It was later determined by investigators that Hussein had likely gotten cold feet, being caught on CCTV about five minutes after the explosions in a corner shop just outside of King's Cross Station. This singular revelation unveiled the true evil of the bombers that day. This was the definitive proof that the bombs were not on a preset timer, but instead that the bombers had to actively detonate the devices themselves, fully aware of all of those around them. It was at about the same time that Hussein entered the corner shop that emergency services would arrive to each of the stations, ambulance staff and firefighters rushing into action, not waiting for the all killer, not caring about their own safety. As they made their way into the dusty catacombs of the London Underground, they would find hundreds of ordinary men and women, all of who were rushing to the trains to do whatever they could to help. It would be later estimated that over a thousand people volunteered to help emergency services that day. At 9.24am, Hussein was caught on CCTV, passing London's legal quarter. From here, he would catch the bus to Old Street Station. 
It was at this time that the Metropolitan Police would declare a major incident. Up until now, it had been assumed that the chaos was the result of some catastrophic electrical fault. Now it had become clear that London was under attack. It was also around this time that the evacuation of a quarter of a million people from the underground was completed, the majority being herded onto replacement bus services to carry on as if nothing had happened. It was one such replacement bus service, the number 30 to Tavistock Square, that Hasib Hussein would board alongside some survivors from one of his compatriots' attacks. At 9.47 a.m., Hussein would detonate his bomb, killing 13 innocent people. One of the very few pieces of luck that day would be that he chose to detonate his device outside the headquarters of the British Medical Association, the governing body of doctors in the UK. By pure coincidence, the BMA had been hosting a conference for the best trauma doctors in the country on that day, and through their quick-thinking actions, countless lives would be saved when the doctors turned the BMA building into an emergency medical centre. With Hussein's detonation, the deadliest attack in London's history since World War II and the deadliest attack in British history since the Lockerbie bombing of 1998, it was over. 52 ordinary people, who had just been going about their everyday lives, had been murdered. Another hundred suffered life-changing injuries, and a further 700 suffered serious injuries. This left the British public with two questions. Who and why? At 12.05 p.m. on the day of the explosions, then-Prime Minister Tony Blair would leave the ongoing G8 summit to make a press conference. The American President George Bush leaning just over his shoulder. Blair would confirm that an attack had taken place and that multiple people had been killed. He further promised to return to the UK immediately and take personal charge of the situation. Five minutes later, the first question would be answered when Al-Qaeda would take responsibility for the attack. One of the weirder and more British happenings of the day would occur at 3 p.m., an event which would become a rallying cry for not only those still in London, but those all over the country. At 3 p.m. of the day of one of the most destructive terror attacks in British history, public transport in London was reopened. Now, to any foreign viewers today, that might be confusing. But in the British mindset, this was a representation of the Blitz spirit, the idea that no matter what they do to ruin our lives, we will never let them alter how we act. It was also at 3 p.m. that the first intelligence service operatives would arrive at the scene of the attacks. It didn't take long to identify the attackers, a partially intact passport being thanked for the quick identification of Khan. From there, they had to move swiftly. It was obvious that the cell that had organized these attacks could have been bigger than just these four bombers. And it was. On the 12th of July, six properties across London, one property in Aylesbury and the aforementioned bomb-making factory in Leeds, would all be raided by armed police. One man was taken into custody, and it was discovered that the situation was far worse than the intelligence services ever imagined. Documents found on that day have never been declassified, but we know that they made the intelligence services realize that this cell wasn't just half a dozen radicalized terrorists operating out of their shed. They discovered that it might just have been the largest terror cell ever uncovered on British soil. This instantly changed the focus. No longer were they looking to explain 7-7, a more pressing matter had to come first. They had to catch the rest of this cell before there was a repeat attack, and they failed. In the early hours of the 22nd of July, a second attack would be put into motion. This time, five bombers would embark onto the London Underground with homemade bombs, specifically having chosen trains that were still carrying an increased load thanks to the lines that had been put out of action. Luckily, these bombers were far worse at their job than their predecessors. Not a single person was injured or killed in these attacks outside of a passerby who suffered an asthma attack. All five would then evade police for a few days before finally being hunted down and sentenced to life imprisonment for conspiracy to murder, as well as one more man who uh, was never named but was charged with being the primary orchestrator of all nine attacks. Tragically, it would be in the hunt for these bombers that the final victim of 7-7 would lose his life. Jean-Charles de Menendez was a 26-year-old electrician boarding the underground to go to work. Unbeknownst to him, the attempted attack had taken place about 20 minutes before he made his way to Stockwell Station. De Menendez had the misfortune to match the description of one of the attackers almost perfectly. And as a result, he was followed into the station by two undercover officers. Shortly after boarding a train, the officers would engage and kill him. It would later be determined, by an inquest, that despite the fact that the officers had made no attempts to take him alive and shouted no warnings, that the killing was lawful due to their honest beliefs that he had a bomb and he posed an imminent threat to human life. Despite the ongoing debate around the lawfulness of his death, it cannot be disputed that Jean-Charles de Menendez would not have died that day if not for the 7-7 attacks. 
It has long been recognized that 7-7 had a wider effect beyond just those who had their lives catastrophically altered. It set British justice back decades. The clearest and first example of this was the policy that would lead to the shooting of Jean-Charles de Menendez on the 22nd, a shoot-to-kill policy. This meant that armed police were no longer required to shout any warnings, attempt any de-escalation, or take suspects in alive where they believed there to be a serious risk to human life. It would later be determined in the High Court that this policy was the definitive cause for de Menendez's death, and it would be ruled unlawful. Yet even after the tragedy of the 22nd, the paranoia continued to spread further and further. Ultimately, this led to a speech on the 5th of August by Tony Blair in which he would declare that the rules of the game have changed. This resulted in the introduction of a swath of new criminal offences, which had the official purpose of curbing radicalism. This included laws which made it criminal to support any statement which could be construed as supporting a terroristic aim, a law so broad that many schoolchildren were even charged with contravening it, a law enabling the police to detain an individual indefinitely if they believed they had absolutely anything at all to do with terrorism, which resulted in several people being detained for five years without trial or any explanation for why they were being held, and ultimately the straw that broke the camel's back would come when the government attempted to reduce the availability of lawyers in certain terror trials in late 2009. Ultimately, these changes to the law would end by the mid-2010s when a large group formed from the families of the victims, prominent lawyers, and other rights activists would petition Parliament, saying that the victims would never want what had happened to them to be used to justify the creation of a police state. Despite this, many of the laws created in the wake of 7-7 still remain on the books today, and several times these laws have been called into question. The most recent figures have suggested that not a single terror attack has actually been prevented via the post-7-7 anti-terror legislation. The 7th of July, 2005, is a day that will ring in the ears of British history. It is a day when four people almost brought the entire United Kingdom to heel. A day that they murdered 52 innocent people. And a day where the most basic principles of the rule of law would almost collapse in on themselves. Yet it is also a day when the United Kingdom came together, where hundreds of people put their own lives on the line to try and help people they never met and where the British public would band together to announce that we would not let fear extinguish the freedoms which have been so hard-earned. Whether you see 7-7 as a litmus test for the principles of British democracy, or whether you see it as the moments where the wars in the Middle East had their catastrophic consequences revealed, ultimately 56 people, 57 counting Jean-Charles de Menendez, would lose their lives as a result of the bombers. Those 57 people just going about their normal daily routines. Those are who we should remember, and it is honor of those people that we tell the story of 7-7 today.